Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I say this all the time, you guys, but I really am super excited about this conversation. <laughs> um, we, as purebred dog enthusiasts, encounter a lot of pushback from the world, and particularly those of us who have brachycephalic breeds uh, run into this a lot. And so I have with us today Eddie Zook, who's the OFA cheerleader for the Boaz project that we're going to talk about. And I also have uh, Dr. Kathleen Smiler, who's the representative from the Pug Dog Club of America. And we are going to talk about the brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome <laughs> testing process that was developed at the University of Cambridge in England. And I I just think this is such an amazing project. So thank you guys for coming and talking to us about this. Thank you, Laura. Excellent. So Eddie, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you because I know you have been the moving force behind um is it licensing? Is that what you did? The OFA has licensed this program, is that correct? That is correct. So talk to us about how you did that and why you did that, because I feel like this is an important part of that story. Okay. Uh, so the OFA has been interested in in uh, working with the issues that surround BOAS. And of course, BOAS stands for the brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. And we've been interested in working with this particular um, disease entity and, and assisting brachycephalic breeders in not only producing and breeding healthier dogs, but uh, also trying to combat and present sort of a positive PR narrative mm -hmm. against all the pushback that these breeds are getting, that they're all unhealthy and none of them can breathe and so forth. And unquestionably, there are definitely health issues in these breeds, um, but to suggest that all of them have breathing difficulties and all of them are unhealthy is simply not the case. Um, so we've been looking at various different tools. What, what could we do to, to assist these breeders? So several years ago, uh, we developed within the OFA uh, a new database for tracheal hypoplasia. Um, that's been implemented. Uh, that's utilized pretty widely by lots of bulldog breeders, lots of Frenchie breeders, um, some Boston Terrier breeders, et cetera. We looked for a while at trying to develop a, a way of... Um, Seeing if we could have like a, a NARES database and try and evaluate uh, whether the dogs had nice wide open nostrils or whether they were um, whether there was any stenosis, we had a difficult time in trying to develop any consistency in right. in the measuring. Um, so we sort of you know we had a lot of false starts and fails in in that. So that that kind of got sidelined. But the whole time we were aware of the efforts that were going on in the UK, specifically at the University of Cambridge and one of the researchers there by the name of Dr. Jane Ladlow. And Dr. Ladlow um, worked through this issue for, for quite a bit of time. And the result of her efforts was what they called the respiratory function grading scheme. All right. Um, so they had that implemented in the UK um, and it was just starting to get rolling right at the uh, the advent when when uh, COVID hit. And we entered into, into some discussions with Dr. Ladlow, figuring it didn't make sense. You know, we were doing a lot of things that we were trying to do, um, but we weren't running into a lot of success with the exception of the tracheal hypo, uh, hypoplasia database, um, which is based upon a radiograph, by the way. Mm. And um, so in our discussions with her, we decided it didn't really make sense for us to reinvent the wheel. Um, she had already put so much work into this and they developed this, this exam protocol uh, and it seemed like this would be something that would fit quite nicely here in North America as well. So in those early discussions, we we thought we were going to get rolling and then, uh, you know, COVID hit and that sort of sidelined everything. Right. Um, the Kennel Club in the UK had a, uh, a brachycephalic um, uh, health uh, conference scheduled. I believe that was in early 2020. Then that got postponed. It got rescheduled, then canceled. Right. And uh, so again, just, you know, the bottom line is all, all this, the progress got derailed for quite some time. Mm. Um, but about a year and a half ago, we were sort of able to resurrect this. And we identified uh, 
two veterinarians here in the U.S. that were going to be our point, our subject matter experts, and our primary point of contact to work with uh, Dr. Ladlow. Now, over in the U.K., in order to be one of the approved examiners, they have to specifically go through training um, right. by the folks at the University of Cambridge. And again, because of some residual uh, COVID uh, issues and so forth, we knew that, and because of cost as well, we knew that it probably wasn't going to be terribly effective um, for us to send, to sponsor a whole bunch of vets to go uh, travel over to Cambridge and undergo this testing. Right. So we did identify two veterinarians and they became our subject matter experts and primary points of contact. And they worked directly with Dr. Ladlow um, through a long series of discussions, through some video training, et cetera. And they became our initial um, approved examiners. So again, you've got uh, an exam protocol and a, and a grading scheme already developed in, in, uh, in the implementation process in the UK. Um, so we wanted to take full advantage of that. The University of Cambridge, in turn, was working with the Kennel Club. And whenever I say mm -hmm. the Kennel Club, I'm referring to um, not our AKC here, right. um, but the Kennel Club is how the, the Brits refer to their Kennel Club over in the UK. Right. Um, so the Kennel Club widely also embraced this and began to roll it out. And they developed a licensing program because what they basically figured is there are going to be lots of okay. countries besides just the United States mm -hmm. interested in using the same exam protocol. And uh, so they developed a licensing program where they could uh, allow other countries to use the same uh, grading scheme. The real, you know, the, the, the guts of that license is not that we have to pay any kind of a license fee or that we're bound by any kind of intellectual property issues. It's more along the lines of that we agree to use the same exam protocol, the same grading matrix, and more importantly, we agreed, agreed to share all these results with this international group of collaborators and share all these results into a centralized database um, so that you know more research can be made and more uh, effective breeding decisions can be done. So while we here in the uh, US and Canada will be connect collecting all this information and including it in the OFA database, we'll also be feeding it back to the University of Cambridge and the Kennel Club, who will also be collecting results from the UK um, and from all the other countries in the, in the United Kingdom, but as well as all the countries in mainland Europe who are also participating in the licensing program. I just I just think this is so important. And Kathleen, I'd really love to have you speak a little bit from, from the Pug Dog Club of America in terms of why and how you became involved. I know also the French Bulldog Club of America and the Bulldog Club of America, right, are all participating in this venture here in the U.S. Well, in my capacity on the health committee um, of the club, I try to monitor pug, um, pug health all over the world and keep track of testing in other countries. And so I interacted with the British people for a while. And so we were well aware of what was what was starting with those tests. And actually the, the show pugs were doing quite well. You know, I believe the only ones to take the test. And <clears throat> so then I wrote Eddie and I said, boy, could we do this here? And he said, well, we're going to. So that's, um, and the more we told our club members about it, the more excited they got because mm -hmm. the three main problems um, for pugs are PDE and BOAS and the pug myelopathy. Right. So um, the club was very anxious that we participate. Yeah. And just to be able to have a good handle on it, I, I went to the two um, early meetings in St. Louis and then to Portland. Mm -hmm. try to help i love yeah, that I, yeah laura i want to jump into it to what mm -hmm. dr smiler said and um again while the the ofa basically had all this on our radar and we were considering all this we were really pushed forward in the effort in terms of prioritizing a little a little more um by those three parent clubs all three yeah. parent clubs directly contacted the ofa um meaning the bulldog club of america the french bulldog club of america and the pug dog club of america all three contacted us and asked us um, to proactively pursue um, the implementation of this program here in North America. And whenever I say sort of U.S., I, I, need, to always, I need to mention um, and Canada. be clear, sometimes I use the U.S. and North America interchangeably. That's kind of important, and, and it's, uh, if I make a mistake on my part, I always mean to say North America because the Canadians have uh, been very involved and in where the Canadian Kennel Club has been very involved in this effort. And uh, so basically this is a, a joint thing 
um, all the efforts that we're doing are uh, for U.S. dog owners as well as Canadian. And and so I think the outreach, the AVMA has has a post about this. I mean, how exciting is that, right? That we can bring positive brachycephalic news from the AVMA. The American Veterinary Medical Association is saying nice things about brachycephalic dogs. I love this. This makes me happy. So... <laughs> Um, Eddie and Kathleen, when do you guys jump in? Um, how how are we doing the training with the veterinarians? I understand this is very much a hands-on. And you mentioned, Eddie, that we started, uh, you started working with Dr. Ludlow. How are the training processes going here in the U.S. and North America? Yeah, so I'll share a little bit about that because that is important. Because out of the starting gate, there's nothing that that's that, uh, that um, specific or requires in-depth training where so essentially any vet should be able to conduct these exams. However, um, we're very focused on trying to limit it. And the, the thought process behind that is that we want to make sure that there is solid um, consistency and reliability, both intra and inter um, veterinarian. Um, mm -hmm. We want to be pretty comfortable and assured that if a veterinarian in Florida uh, examines a particular dog on a day and gives it a grade zero or grade one, we want to feel assured that if that same dog traveled and had an exam done by a different examiner in Washington state, as far away as you could get, um, that that examiner in Washington state would also assign the same grade. Okay. And in order to do that, we wanted to make sure that these vets uh, underwent um, some level of training to ensure that they fully understood um, that exam protocol the background on how that protocol was developed, as well as the grading matrix. So we started out with those two initial veterinarians that we had identified um, that are each um, ordered veterinary surgeons and that had a specific in interest in respiratory issues and in uh, soft tissue surgery um, with regards to correcting respiratory issues. Uh, so those two vets were uh, Dr. Kathleen Hamm at the University of Florida and Dr. Kelly Thyman at uh, Texas A&M. They worked closely with Dr. Ladlow at the University of Cambridge um, and to the point where Dr. Ladlow felt more than assured that these two vets would be qualified to lead the effort here in the US. What we're doing going forward is sort of a, a pyramid scheme, if you will. So we had right, those two yeah. initial vets, right, mm -hmm. that got approved um, really by Dr. Ladlow. So the OFA didn't make that initial assessment that was done by by Cambridge. So we started out with those two and we had uh, we went through two pilot events last year. And at those two pilot events, we had two additional veterinarians that uh, attended and participated and under the guidance and uh, basically shadowing under uh, Drs. Ham and Thyman they then became approved examiners. So we went into this Portland event, where, which was our first official screening event, with mm -hmm. four approved examiners. Uh, the two additional uh, veterinarians that we trained were Dr. Elizabeth Rosansky from Tufts and Dr. Carrie Stefaniak, um, who is an emergency practitioner in uh, Wisconsin. And so we attended that uh, the Portland event specifically with all four of our approved veterinarians, as well as we then invited three additional veterinarians to shadow and mentor under those four and leave that event as trained examiners. So after Portland, we added Dr. Linnell Johnson, who's on faculty at UC Davis, and again, has a very specific interest mm -hmm. um, in respiratory issues. Uh, we added Dr. Allison Collier, um, from the Ontario Veterinary College in Gulf mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. And she's sort of taking the lead working directly with the Canadian Kennel Club Great. on the further rollout of the program north of the border. And finally, we had Dr. Alan Frank, who is a practitioner in Maryland, but that has owned Bulldogs, has shown Bulldogs, is a member of the uh, Bulldog Club of America, um, and will be sort of uh, taking a lead in sort of that mid-Atlantic region. Um, so we now have seven approved examiners um, and we intend to slowly add uh, more and increase that pool, um, but we always want to maintain some level of control and keep it um, fairly small so that we can ensure that they can um, be in regular contact with each other and that they can have a true sort of peer collegial relationship mm -hmm. as this program rolls out a little further again so that we can maintain um, consistency and that as issues arise um, that they can 
discuss them and learn from each other. So we left those two initial pilot events last year feeling pretty secure about things, but there's no question that things with more dogs, mm -hmm. we had a lot more dogs to work with in Portland, um, that there were some learning experiences that happened out of that. And we wanna make sure that it's a group that's small enough that where they all know each other um, and have a good working relationship that as additional learning curves um, come to light that they can all benefit from that. Well, and Kathleen, talk about, I mean, this is, designed to be an objective test, but human, right? People. So talk to us about what your observations, having now attended these two different, three different events about how you felt that went for the dogs and for the veterinarians that were working. Um, as far as consistency or mm -hmm. just the experience? The, the whole thing. Okay. The whole thing. Um, I think the veterinarians were extremely enthusiastic. Cat Ham and I are good friends. She's my own dog's doctor. And um, they were patient. They were excited. They had put together a lot of the software for the um, recording on their own, I think. And so, and they interacted beautifully and there were never any serious disputes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the the participants were quite pleased too. You know, I told you the first one was in that snowstorm, right? And uh, it was it we <clears throat> saw the consistency. That, as Eddie said, there's a couple parts of this that the, a consistent person has to do them. But um, I think I went and sat in the meet the breeds box with the pug people after the in Portland. And everybody was quite satisfied and they were getting their scores and they were coming back and waving their papers and stuff. So it was, they were very enthusiastic, you know, about having taken the test and passed it and um, or not passed it. There were a few that didn't, but um, no one really complained other than um, something like, like a lady wanted to be in the exam room and another lady didn't, but, but right. I think our club in general was very satisfied and we've done a lot of publicity to our own members, mm -hmm. encouraging them to do this. And our, mm -hmm. our Facebook page, there's been something, Brenda's put out something almost every week. And so they had more than enough information to um, be encouraged to come. Good. And, and they felt like the, the test was, they were comfortable with the test's results and how it was conducted. So that made them the want were. to encourage more people, right? I'd say across the board, the pub people were. Excellent. Okay. So the big reveal now, Eddie, do we have numbers? How did, how did that go in Portland? Can we talk about that? Is that still secret? <laughs> no, it's not secret at all. So we, we, um, we examined somewhere, let's see, I think we did a, um, yeah, looking at those Portland totals, we we examined 54 dogs. We actually did 60, but we had a couple breeds that that weren't on the like official breed participant list yet. Okay. Um, so we had 54 between uh, Bulldogs, Frenchies, and Pugs, and we also had a couple Boston's and Peaks. And nice. because they're also brachycephalic breeds, uh, we wanted to go ahead and do those because the owners uh, volunteered, mm -hmm. and we felt that that would give us sort of a baseline going forward. Um, because the intent would be at some point in time in the future uh, to add additional brachycephalic breeds as appropriate. Um, but of those 54 dogs that we did, we had uh, overwhelmingly um, pretty good results. So uh, we had 10 grade one, grade zeros. Um, so the grade zeros are basically, everything was good. These dogs were good breathers. They had nice wide open nostrils. There were no, um, no, uh, uh, no sounds of turbulence or anything during the auscultation. So everything was looking pretty good. Uh, we had 18 grade ones, um, which is also good. Means that uh, in general, nothing could be heard without a stethoscope and you could only hear some, some minor um, issues with the stethoscope, but the dogs are basically still found to be clinically unaffected by BOAS. We did have 25 uh, grade twos and we had one lone grade three. Um, in, that's actually really yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, that's that's great. Yeah. And I, I think that goes to to prove the point. Um, the, the part of this is about that PR neg uh, narrative that not all bulldogs suffer breathing difficulties. Not all Frenchies suffer breathing difficulties, and not all pugs do either. That there is a that there is a large 
old in all three of those breeds where there are good, healthy dogs that breathe fine, that don't uh, show signs of exercise intolerance. Um, and we can work with those dogs and breed them and hopefully breed lots of future generations of good, healthy um, Frenchies, pugs, and bulldogs. Right. So again, and Kathleen, I'll send this to you. The goals for the club is to not just show that PDCA members' dogs are healthy, right? But to help make more healthy dogs. Am I right? Well, right. And um, if we're, they were talking about scheduling the test at the national specialty for the three breeds. And the pug people are set up to do it in October. Um, I don't know if you're going to do any more all breeds because that was kind of successful, you know, to get the three breaky breeds in. Actually, you get more for your Mm -hmm. your, your bang for your buck <laughs> so, yeah, if you don't mind laura i think i want to do two things i want to um do a, a real quick description of what what this exam yes. entails because we yes. haven't really discussed that i was just and then, headed yeah. that direction okay and then we'll also jump in and talk about uh future clinics and what are sort of where we're thinking in terms of where this is going to go um, so in terms of the exam itself, it's, it's completely non-invasive and it should be a non-stressful experience for the dog. Um, there are basically four steps involved. So the first step is, is basically just a, a short health survey that the owner is going to do um, regarding the, the dog's breathing history. Um, are there any negative things that have been observed? Um, does the dog snore? Does it make sounds? Does it uh, have regurgitation issues after it eats and so forth? Just some, some, a little bit of history for, for the veterinarians before they um, actually begin the exam process. Um, then the dog will have a brief physical exam. Um, again, the dog should be nice and calm. Um, it should be in an area where the veterinarians are going to be able to hear clearly um, because the exam is going to be based upon auscultation. All right. So the examiner is going to take a stethoscope and they're going to position it gently on the side of the neck over the larynx um, and listen for any sounds. And this is going to establish a baseline all right, um, that they can then compare to the post-exercise auscultation. So following that baseline exam, and they'll, they'll make certain assessments after that, um, there's going to be a short exercise test. Um, that sounds a little daunting, but it shouldn't be anything um, that bad. So it's a, a short exercise test, and that consists of what we call a brisk three-minute walk. All right. Um, it's timed, and the test is, uh, the exercise test is designed to expose any kind of clinical signs of the disease in an otherwise calm or asymptomatic dog. Um, we are not there to stress the dog out to the point where we're assessing uh, cardiovascular fitness or anything like that. It's purely to get that respiratory system up and working. Um, okay, so the brisk three minute walk, it's timed. And we do have a goal where that dog should hopefully be walking approximately three to four um, miles per hour. So that's about okay. a 15, 15 mile, um, 50 minute mile or a 20 minute mile, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like a, a, a casual, right? Walk in the park, um, but a, a brisk walk, right? The um, speed that those dogs would go around the ring realistically. Um, yeah, pretty I mean, it's pretty close. I mean, we don't really usually, I, I think you would think of it as a little maybe fast for a bulldog in the ring, okay. but we okay. certainly do see Frenchies trucking around the ring at, mm -hmm. at, at this pace and definitely pugs. I mean, we see yeah. lots of pugs that just get up and go. And Trust um, me, I showed a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> they can so zoom that, when they want to. Yeah, that, that speed's not daunting for them at all. And then, um, after the exercise, immediately afterwards, we're going to repeat the auscultation. So they come back into the exam area, same exact process, um, stethoscope placed over the larynx on the side of the neck, and um, listen for sounds, listen for turbulence, listen for stirter noises, strider noises, if there are any. And then based upon that auscultation, that is the, the um, one that's going to lead to the actual grade. And there's um, you, even though there are some thoughts that this is sort of subjective, it's really not that subjective. I mean, post-exercise, you're going to do the auscultation and you're going to either hear things or you're not going to hear things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then based upon that, there's a very specific matrix that if this, then that, right? So if you are not hearing things, then it's going to be probably a, a zero. If you're hearing some minor things, then it's probably going to be in that one range. And if you're hearing specific types of sounds that are very audible on the stethoscope, um, and even without the stethoscope, um, then that's dog is probably going to grade as a two or a three. Right. So that's the exam process. Again, it should be uh, non-stressful on the dog. It's non-invasive. 
Um, if the dog does begin to show any kind of signs of exercise intolerance, heat intolerance, um, any kind of stress at all, we're, we're ready to just shut it down. The last thing that we want to do is have a bad experience for the dog. And I did mention heat intolerance. So it's also very important to point out that these, these exams have to be done um, indoors in a climate controlled environment. We did do one of the pilots last year outdoors, but it was a really brisk um, day in the, you know, in the fifties. So none of the dogs were, were, um, were stressed by the heat in any way. Um, but in terms of going forward, we're, we do intend to sort of make that sort of a, an exam requirement that it is done indoors uh, in a climate uh, controlled environment, just so that the, uh, you know, there's probably some outdoor environments that would be fine, but we don't want to give those owners a reason to complain if it didn't go their way, right? right? Um, so everything again, level, comes, everything yeah, level. <laughs> level playing field. So it is going to be required that they are indoors in a, in a climate controlled environment. Um, the next topic that we're going to touch on uh, that uh, Dr. Smiley mentioned and then you you were leading into is the, the thought process on, on future uh, clinics. Yes. So we feel that these are probably going to go a couple different ways. Um, there's going to be a point in time where the OFA is going to have to step aside and we're not going to get in the business of scheduling these and sponsoring them and administering them, you know, indefinitely all over the country. Um, but we do feel that we're probably going to do probably two or three more of these this year um, and try and have them in geographically dispersed areas so that we can get uh, people from different parts of the country able to participate. And we will use those opportunities to hopefully train a few more approved assessors and we will do those using obviously the uh the seven approved examiners that we have to date so that's one flavor of exam that will probably happen again we're, we, we'd like to target maybe three of those um this year happening at all breed events where there is whether it's indoors climate controlled in an area where we would have large entries of all three breeds to draw from and probably in an area that's in close proximity to one of our existing examiners um, to help facilitate their ability to schedule and attend sure the second and flavor is going to be just you know, real ahead. quick eddie um so are you going to keep up i love this pyramid concept of training the vets are you going to keep trying to do that this year as you're scheduling these around? Yeah, so it's a very slow rollout. So all three of those events, if we can get them scheduled, the ones I sort of alluded to just now, the intent would be at all three of those to try and get at least one new examiner trained at all three of those or four of those, however many we do, knowing that one of our primary, that initial core group, that one of those four would be there um, to conduct the training. Because what we don't want to do as we work our way down this pyramid is we want to keep the, the the training component up at that top level of those those four those four guys initially. So we don't want to go like three levels down and have the, the level three guys be training level fours and level fours right. train level five and build it that right. way. We want to keep more consistency by having that initial core group do um, the preponderance of the training. Um, so we're looking at hopefully uh, three or four more all breed events this year um, where we can draw upon all three breeds. Then the next flavor of uh, clinic that would happen is at all three of those breeds national specialty events. Uh, so the Bulldog Club, uh, the Pug Dog Club, and the French Bulldog Club, all three have expressed an interest in having one of these clinics available at their specialties this fall. Um, we've identified what the dates are, we've identified what the locations are, and I feel 95% confident that we will be able to um, work with those three national specialties and making sure that we've got um, at least one day of clinics available at their events. Um, uh, between the seven examiners that we have that are approved now, all of them have expressed uh, agreement that it's important to attend the national specialties. And between of the seven of them, I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to make sure that we can find somebody that can work it into their, their calendar and their schedule. And then finally, what we will do is basically, we don't have it quite ready, but we will present basically a, uh, a guideline document that we would give to all three parent clubs that they can filter down and give to their regional specialty clubs um, for any of those clubs that are interested in hosting one of these events. So we want to get to the point where the individual specialty clubs all around the country are going to become the primary sources 
of these clinics. So, you know, let's say hypothetically, I don't know if there is one, but the Pug Dog Club in St. Louis, they're holding their specialty event. They want to hold one of these clinics. We will assist them in um, the administrative work. We'll assist them in finding one of the approved veterinarians that can work, but that'll be basically um, their event, their function, their clinic, much like um, any Aubrey Club or specialty mm -hmm. club routinely um, at dog shows all around the country every weekend is hosting um, eye exam clinics, cardiac clinics, et cetera. So we would want to make this basically get to the point where it becomes um, almost a norm for many mm -hmm. of these brachycephalic breeds if they're having a health testing clinic to offer this up as one of the, the options that are available. Excellent. And Kathleen, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but speak to the Pug Dog Club of America as the representative of who's on the call here today. I, your goals going forward for the breed and for this testing system? Well, we're certainly very sensitive to the criticism that's um, been directed toward brachycephalic breeds. I think we're fortunate we're in the U.S. where it isn't a regulated activity, nor has the Veterinary Association attacked, you know, the breeds as they did in Europe. Um, we're going to make this information available to our members and highly encourage them. I wrote a couple articles already. I'd like to interview a couple of the people who, whose dogs were tested, you know, kind of a testimonial to encourage people um, that it was, was not a problem. And then eventually for our puppy buyers, you know, I'd love to educate the puppy buyers on what to ask for. And then if they get results, from the breeder, take the results to the veterinarian. Their veterinarian and discuss them. And if the veterinarian's not familiar with the testing of purebred dogs, he should do a little homework. So I think it'll be very positive. Excellent. Across the board. And hopefully we'll breed healthier pugs. Well, mm -hmm. and I think that more than anything else, that we have reasonably healthy pugs from what the system is showing us already, and we can get a notch higher and we can reach out to in all three of these breeds and hopefully all of the brachycephalic breeds, this would be my joy that we could reach beyond our club members, right? And get out to people who are breeding at not quite as high a level and be able to, to bring up, right? The, the, the quality. A lot of puppies that are produced by um, kennels that, never intend to show their dogs and if we can reach to them and and this is especially the public being aware you know of what a good puppy is i think that would be really important be amazing. Um, excellent really good excellent eddie what what in closing as we're as we're finishing up here Talk to us a little bit. You mentioned just briefly earlier uh, Peaks and Bostons and some of the other brachycephalic breeds that we could extend this to, right? That it starts with the core of the the French Bulldogs and the, and the Pugs and the Bulldogs. And do you see that in like a five-year span? Is that kind of where you're looking at that? Yeah, so you need to remember that we that we're licensing this. So this is mm -hmm. a this is a worldwide effort, not just us independently. So mm -hmm. it, it's not like the OFA can just uh, unilaterally make the decision. Okay. Oh, we're just going to include Boston's in our in our program here. Okay. And so the part of the the rationale for including those Boston's and those peaks uh, at the at the um, Portland event is so that we could have some baseline data to share back with the University of Cambridge. And as okay. they begin to work with Boston Terriers and Pekingese and draw um, additional data from all over the world and the participating countries, mm -hmm. they can make the assessment. Are there any things that make these breeds a little bit unique in um, in the issues that we're hearing in their in their breathing? or make them unique in their, their confirmation, which means that we should assess them slightly differently. So the starting position is, okay, here's, oh, here's basically in all these breeds what we're looking for, but it, is it fair to treat them um, with the same grading matrix? And that's why we wanted to include the Boston's and the Peaks, but we didn't, and we did assign them a grade, but mm -hmm. that grade was assigned based upon the existing matrix. Mm -hmm. And as additional data is collected, that would allow Cambridge to determine, are there any things that make these dogs outliers 
that they should be treated or examined somewhat differently. So I, you know, it wouldn't be fair for me to comment. Is that is that a three year sure. goal, a five year Got goal, it. et cetera? That would be a, a Cambridge goal, depending upon the uh, amount of data that they're able to collect. Excellent. They, See, they have, um, I'm sorry. No, they go ahead, Kathleen. Some, they've started some genetics work by um, sponsored by the Kennel Club in England, which will be interesting. And there's she's trying to. Uh, separate the breeds a bit in, in what anatomically is the cause of their brachycephalic obstruction. And then um, in some cases, two dogs will look exactly alike and one is brachycephalic and the other isn't. And they're trying you know, to evaluate what part of the dog needs to be hopefully um, modified in future. You know, mm -hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. And Eddie, thank you for the clarification. I did not understand that it was from the from the the kennel club from the UK Cambridge people that it was um, narrowed to just these three breeds and not the entire galaxy of brachycephalic breeds. So that is super interesting information. Yeah, and that you know that's based upon all their early research um, that they were able to do, and and um, you know I don't know I'll be honest with you I don't know some of the terminology of some of this uh, very specific equipment, but Dr. Ladlong and and Cambridge they actually developed another tool, um, which would probably be a little more. Um, specific in its findings, but it involved basically a controlled chamber, you know, air controlled chamber where the yes. dog was placed in. I remember so reading and, something yeah, about and, that. <laughs> and of course that would not be um, a very uh, economically efficient tool to try and roll out universally um, all over the world to, to, to do these dogs. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they, they used those baseline scores and then did develop this exam protocol and compared on all the all the same dogs in both, so that they were then able to have sort of a matrix that, if the dog scored this way in the chamber, mm -hmm. and after exercise you heard the following things, this is how they match up. And that's um, uh, again one of the things that adds to the objectivity right. of this particular um, exam protocol. Right. Is is the tie back to the the chamber data? Okay. That is super fascinating. All right. Well, thank you both so incredibly much. I am have been following this with absolute fascination and really wanted to make it to Portland. And by the time I had a chance, I couldn't get there. So <laughs> I'm sorry to have missed it, but I am thrilled to hear that it is going to continue through the course of the year. And listeners, Find a, find one. Get your dogs. Get this. Let's get some. Let's get some dogs in this program. I think this is amazing. So thank you both very very much. All right. Thanks for having us, Laura.